All right, I think we should start it's after five o'clock. So let's call this meeting to order of the Conference Select Board on December 20th, 2021. It is 5.05 p.m. Uh, we don't need a roll call vote. We're all here live. Uh, so we have all five of us. So we will be going into executive session and returning approximately 6.30 p.m. in the open session. Got it. Okay. okay. Okay, we are back in open session on December 20th, 2021. Uh, okay, so at this time we will have the consent agenda. Move to approve the consent agenda, which includes the town accountant warrant of December 23rd, 2021, gift acceptance of $10,000 from the Susanna J. E. Bettle Foundation to the Council on Aging. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we are going to wait a minute for the town manager's report and the chair's remarks to go to item seven, update from town council on opioid litigation and possible vote authorizing the town manager or interim to join the settlement agreement. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a very brief update. So um, the Attorney General's office has negotiated a settlement with several of the opioid manufacturers um, that involves a portion of the settlement going to cities and towns. Um, the uh, Attorney General, the State Attorney General's office has asked towns to sign on to a settlement agreement um, essentially for that uh, to distribute that funding. The exact amount is still somewhat in flux. It will be finalized probably in the course of the next week because you don't have a meeting coming up between now and January 2nd, which is sort of the, the end date for when that will happen. Our recommendation is to authorize the town manager uh, or the acting town manager in this case um, to sign on behalf of the town. My colleague, Christina Marshall or I will, will We'll contact you as, as soon as we know that the number's set. What's really left in flux is how much the towns get versus um, goes to the state. So um, our recommendation is to essentially hold until you know the final number, but that the settlement is is a is is good. The town I do not believe is engaged in, in separate litigation with opioid manufacturers. You don't have your own claims, so there's really not much uh, downside to to signing. But waiting is prudent. Is it the pharma settlement? It is one of the pharma settlements, yeah. There's different entities. The one that was yes. accepted by the judge? Yes, it is, yes. I believe so. Right. And I assume that the abatement measures that would qualify for this money, um, that we the town would be free to engage with other nonprofits or the hospital or whatever mechanism was in town to implement the, the abatement measures? I, I know that that is correct. Um, and that I'm not even sure it's even that restricted to just abatement measures for this particular pot of money. Some, some are, some are. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so given that the judge did not accept the settlement, is there even anything to sign? That's the par Purdue Pharma that they said that because the law cannot uh, eliminate liability uh, for the family that the settlement was not valid. I, I think we're, uh, maybe I misheard Mr. Dane. This is a settlement that, that is going forward. This is the Attorney General Massachusetts settlement that is, is going forward. Okay, so it's not related to that it's one. It's not related to the one that maybe on the, that you're thinking of on the news. I'm sorry, I miss, Sackler. yes, the Sackler Fund, yes. I'm sorry, I, I misheard. I thought Mr. Dane said okay. the one that was accepted, which is was where we're at. Are there some um, restrictions or requirements like does this is money have to get spent through the um, health department or the or, or do we have a plan for how we're going to spend it or a time frame? Is there a time? The time frame for except for entering into the state's pool is January second between now and January. 2nd. And I think the funds can be expended through twenty eighteen. If I oh, sorry, yeah, it's, it's twenty twenty eight. Yeah, twenty eight. Yeah, meant to say. And on what? Yeah, um, Stephen, do you know if there's some restrictions on where it has to be spent? 
Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that the, the intent of it is to offset costs incurred responding to the opioid crisis. Uh, and so I think we have to look at what, you know, what's the focus of those, of those, where those costs were incurred and, and what can we do moving forward? I, it's, it's, it's overall, it's, it's very broad. It's, it's, it's funding prevention, harm reduction, treatment and recovery efforts. According to it's very broad. And um, I apologize for that earlier con confusion that it's a, it's the pharmaceutical distributors in this case and Johnson and Johnson is, is this, which is different than okay. Right. There we go. All right. Any other discussion on this item? Okay. And we'll have a motion. Sure. Move to authorize the duly appointed uh, appointed town manager to enter into a settlement agreement by and between the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office and other parties on behalf of the town of Concord for the purpose of joining the opioid settlement fund. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you very much, Nina. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure if Chris is still here. I think he may have left. So I'm, I I'm here. Oh, okay. Um, good. Then we will continue on and talk about the select board license renewals for calendar year 2022. Have alcohol licenses, common VIC licenses, class one and two auto licenses, weekday entertainment licenses, in holder licenses, and tour guides. Um, Chris, I understand that almost everyone has now turned in their paperwork. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay. Do members have questions? Doesn't the clerk have to sign them all? I mean, I did. A I think training. that's right. Yeah. Matt will have to make arrangements with Chris to sign them before January 1st. Okay. Writer's cramp. <laughs> Uh-oh, you don't have pens. That's right. That's all right. I think I can find one at home. All right. So. Questions anyway. from the board? Are any of these? Okay, seeing none. We'll uh, take a motion. Move to approve all licensed, all listed license applications as detailed in the administrative manager's memo dated uh, December 18th, 2021 and included in the board packet for this meeting. Second. All in favor? Hi, Matt. Aye. Matt, I'm sorry. Could you, I'm sorry, could you um, amend the motion? Um, we included some tour guide licensees today, so we had to uh, update the board packet those tour guide licensees are just staff members at the visitor center. So the motion should refer to the memo submitted uh, with today's date. Okay. I withdraw the prior motion. And did you, I move. Did you see that memo? Yes. Okay, great. So move to approve all listed license applications as detailed in the administrative manager's memo dated December 20th, 2021 inclusive of tour guides and visitor staff, visitor center staff, and included in the board packet in the memo sent to us this evening. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion passes. Thank you for all that work, Chris. It's a lot of work chasing all these people down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now we will go back to the town manager's report. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, do you have the print? Uh oh. Hold on, you're frozen. Hmm. Could be the internet here as much as there. Oh, maybe he's coming back. Government Finance Association, Officers Association of America is a best practice. Um, Stephen, can you start over, please? You froze up that whole time. Kidding. Can you hear oh, me all right? Yeah, I can. Can you hear me now? Yes, now, now we, we can. can. Can you please start over? We. Yeah, okay. sorry. It, I had the, I had um, my file access open, and sometimes that gets glitchy. Sorry. Uh, and I'm remote because I'm I'm Zoom administrator this evening, so it's it's hard to do that and be in the meeting. So I apologize for all of that. 
Um, anyway, uh, the finance department um, deserves some recognition. Carrie's there. She can talk in more detail about it. But our CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, was recognized as a uh, or with the Certificate of Achievement from the Government of Finance Officers Association, GFOA. Uh, we were earlier uh, in the year recognized with the budgeting uh, best practices award as well. Um, you know, financial reporting, especially at the municipal level, can be pretty dry. Uh, and so the finance department's work to make it uh, transparent and approachable um, is really a, a great benefit to the community. So I want to congratulate them for their work. And I don't care if you want to add something about that. I think the only thing that I would say is this is a lot of work that is done by many members in the finance. So, uh, my name is the one that is on the award. There are many other people. Well, congratulations to you and the entire team. Thank you. So a couple other things, just quickly, you know, the, the Board of Health also sent out a news and notices late last week about their, they did relook at um, public health data and have issued another um, strong advisory for mask wearing and, and they do support uh, individual businesses for requiring masks for patrons and staff. Um, we're obviously having a, we are monitoring the, uh, Involve it almost feels like we're back at the beginning in many ways, and that and that's um, not a great feeling to be candid. But we are monitoring the shifting data and um, meeting. Uh, I think on Wednesday to have a conversation about should we be changing our policy and approach um, based on the guidance from the Board of Health. Um, we have been following the state's guidance. Uh, throughout the pandemic, and, and as you all know, the state has a, an advisory and not a mandate as well. Um, there's a map that mass, that the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission, MEPC, put out of our area tracking, I think, with some accuracy, who has mandates uh, for all businesses, who has uh, mask requirements just for municipal buildings, and then who has advisories. And uh, it's interesting. It, it's um, um there are a lot of advisories still out there. So I don't think we're behind in the times necessarily. I think it's all unique to the local health data, but we are, we are watching that carefully. Um, just to, you saw the brief note, the, the, the chill, uh, sorry, the Concord Free Public Libraries, Children's Library was supposed to be opening in December. That's got pushed back a little bit into January due to in, in large part supply chain issues. Um, it, you, if, uh, if you haven't had a chance to see the new space, which uh, it probably haven't, hasn't been open, but as soon as you get a chance to go in, it really, the, the addition is magnificent and it's going to be people, are, the um, library patrons are going to fall in love with the new uh, spaces there. It's really great. Um, and then, anyway, and then a um, couple of new things. Uh, there's a, a, a new tour um, at the visitor center that uh, Liz Clayton, who was one of the founders of the Robin House, has been hired as a tour guide, and she um, will um, bring uh, knowledge of African American history to the visitor center and uh, have a tour that um, is going to be a part of the offering for the visitor center. So please be sure to check that out. And the last thing is just to hope everybody enjoys a safe and happy holiday season. Okay, thank you. Questions for the town manager? Do you have questions? Okay. Right, thanks. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Chair's remarks. So um, we had an executive session, as you know, and the, the board discussed the uh, contract for our interim town manager, Kerry LeFleur, who will be beginning on January 1st. And I'm pleased to announce that we have agreed on terms. And um, at this time, we need to take a vote. So do we want to establish the specific terms in the motion? Yes. Um, so move to approve the compensation plan and terms for the interim town manager uh, with a term of uh, six months to uh, 
and and, and sorry, initial term of six months uh, that will continue uh, upon mutual agreement until with 30 days notice uh, can be terminated and with an annual compensation of $202,500 um, with uh, other benefits as already uh, contained in her previous compensation plan. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Congratulations, Terry. We look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, our next announcement is that we have, as you know, a special town meeting on January 20th. We had a public hearing last week. If you didn't get to see the public hearing, you can watch it on the town YouTube channel. Um, also, please know that on Saturday, January 8th, beginning at 9 a.m., we're going to have a annual preview meeting that we always have. This one is for the annual town meeting. So the select board should plan to be there as well as anybody who is going to be presenting an article um, and speaking of that, if you are going to be presenting an article and making a presentation, you want to let Aaron Stevens know, as well as Chris Carmody and Terry LaFleur by December 28th, and then send your presentation to them by December 30th. And um, this is our last meeting with town manager, Stephen Crane. We wish you the best. Um, thank you for all of your service. And we wish you and everyone watching a happy holiday season. Thank you. Okay, we now move on to item nine, the uh, Concord Middle School building project. And as I just said, we had a public hearing on Thursday night. The main thing we have to do here is have the select board take a position on this article. I don't think we really need to discuss the revenue offsets again. That was discussed in detail um, on Thursday night. But if you would like, if you have any questions on that, we can certainly discuss it again. And um, before we take a position, um, the town clerk has asked, if, um, oh, Kari, good, you can explain this better than I can. Take it away, Kari. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, we need to send out a notice to voters to let them know that precincts have changed and some polling locations have changed. And it seems like a good opportunity to also um, try to clarify or at least remind people um, about the special town meeting and special town election. I had asked Chris Carmody, but it was only this afternoon to, to share with you. You probably haven't received it a, a sample notice to voters. And I did also send it to the Office of Campaign Finance because we are limited in what we can say on a uh, government supported mailing. So we're, we are limited to distributing a non-adversarial flyer that informs people of the time, date, and place of the election, contains a brief neutral title for each ballot question or text of questions, and urges residents to vote. So what, what I propose doing is including the special town meeting warrant article language and also the ballot question language. And, I, and, I mm -hmm. and Kari, I believe your question was, if I'm remembering correctly, whether the amount of the debt exclusion should be in that mailing because it can't be at the ballot, correct? Right. It's not the amount is not on the ballot and, and cannot be on the ballot because it's the the vote is just to um, to allow the expenditure. Correct. Under but, the provision, yeah. But um, were you proposing putting that amount or some other explanation in the mailing? 
I, I think that all we can do is either include the warrant article language or if we have it already, the motion language. Because we can't, we, we can't presume what the amount will be that town meeting supports, okay. if it does support. And so that's where it becomes the language that's used in explaining cannot appear to be um, promoting one, one approach or another. Right. Yeah, I, it sounds premature to include the motion language because we don't know the motion that will be yeah. made on the floor town meeting. Right. But what perhaps can we include is the decisions of the finance committee and the select board in uh, recommending affirmative action at an amount? I'll have to check. I will check on that. Stuck with, we're just stuck with the amount that's written in the article. Well, should we, but the, the warrant article does specify an amount. Yes, but um, the finance committee at least uh, recommended affirmative action for an amount less than the amount. But I think that would be advocacy. Is that advocacy? I don't think it's advocacy. Well, okay. <laughs> It's the finance committee is advocating support for the article. All right, never mind. I hey, guess we the can't issue, include it. But the issue is there's very. It's very unlikely that the article is going to be moved to the full amount. Well, right, but that's not the issue. The issue is that when you go to vote and you're in the ballot sure. box, that question cannot have any amount on it. But it's possible that in the mailing, they Kari does, we can put other explanation language, right. including amounts, or possibly how the finance committee voted, but not, we cannot have advocacy. But I guess the only there. amount that we likely could include would be the amount that's on the warrant article, right. which is you could do that. higher probably than what people right. will But it does actually, say not, to, it does say not to exceed. It does, right. it does. So I think Kari, you probably could put something about not to exceed the 103 That's what there were. Million. Yeah, and that is the warrant article. I've also included, for, find out more information about this special town meeting here, and it points to the special town meeting page. With, and it doesn't, so that has a lot of options. It's important that voters can choose to, once they get to the page, to, they're not immediately forced to a certain page that, that um, advocates for supporting or not supporting. So, so this is just a, the, our general town meeting page and for, for the special town meeting and has a number of links and also has a link to the uh, middle school building committee page. Right, when you say page, you're talking about the town website, correct? Yes, I'm sorry, yes. Right, the special town meeting page on our website. Great, that would be good to put that Yeah. In. Yep. Okay, and then I'll, I'll also find out whether the uh, select board or finance committee recommendation can be included. Um, it's also possible that that could become a link on that page. Okay. Should people want to find out more. Thank you for exploring this because I think it's, you know, Henry originally uh, raised at one of our meetings, you know, uh, uh, some avenue to help voters feel informed. And if, if we can include this information yeah, legally, that'll be terrific. Yeah, the, the timing of this mailing is, is interesting because the precinct information has not been updated. They're working on it, but it's statewide. So they haven't finished that. Um, so I may not include that specific information or it would mean delaying this notice going out. Wow. And then you might run into a timing issue because right. the election's coming right up. Yeah. How much time do you need? Like what would be the latest, if the election's February 3rd, what would be the latest date you could mail it? Well, we have to notify the public about polling locations 20 days before. So it's, it's pretty close. It's, you know, yeah. beginning, beginning of January, we have to have the notice out and yeah. the elections division knows that we have an early election. So um, I don't wanna, I, I don't want to send a notice out 
inviting people to, to go to a website to find out what their new precinct is if the precinct information hasn't changed yet. Okay, right. Okay, well, thank you for working on this. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we need to um, take a position on Article 1 of the Special Town Meeting Warrant, which is um, to see if the town will vote um, to appropriate a sum not to exceed 103700000 to be expended under the direction of the town manager, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for the Concord Middle School building. So um, how should we proceed with this? Do we want to... Um, so what was the amount that the finance committee... I was just going to give as a point of information. Right. On uh, December 16th, immediately after the public hearing, the Finance Committee met and voted unanimously to recommend affirmative action uh, at the amount of 102,816,000. And that's the amount that the Middle School Building Committee has most recently recommended, is that right? That's right. Okay. Well, I think it's... it's has real value for us to endorse whatever the figure is that the FinCom has recommended. Well, particularly in this case, since it agree, agrees with what the middle school building committee recommended, which really did. Yeah, but I think. That yes. It's, so it's good, it's good we've got two groups that are. Well, we should, wherever considerably possible, we should be in sync with the FinCom and try to, um, you know, uh, validate their deliberations. Okay. Okay. These microphones. Oh. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think we've just um, been having a conversation that uh, we have two committees, the middle school building committee, who are the experts in this. They've been working on this for several years. And the finance committee, who has unanimously uh, voted for the same number, 102,816,000. So um, any other discussion? Okay, we're ready for a motion. Move to recommend affirmative action on Article 1 of the 2022 Special Town Meeting Warrant in the amount of $102,816,000. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? None. Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. We are now up to Item 10, FY23 Budget Request Initial Presentation. Uh, we'll call on um, Carrie LeFleur. Uh, do you want to start or um, Stephen, are you going to be involved also? Carrie has some slides that she's going to share with us. Um, and we can certainly, um, you know, um, she, I'll let her lead the way and I'll offer any thoughts that I may have on the budget development. I will say, uh, you know, Henry just mentioned um, you know, being in sync with the FinCom. I don't know if I mentioned this at a board meeting, but the Finance Committee changed up the guidelines process this year, and uh, I found it to be a, a positive change and really helped reframe um, certainly my thinking on budget planning. Uh, and I thought it was very productive. So I want to I, I want to just give an acknowledgement to the guidelines subcommittee specifically, but also the finance committee generally about uh, this year's process. I thought it was like I said, I thought it was highly productive. Okay, thank you. So uh, Carrie, if you want to share your screen, sure. I am just working on getting up oh, here. It is the presentation. Okay. All right. So thank you and good evening. Um, in your packet, we shared 
two, two packets of information with you. The first was the town's initial response to the finance committee's guidelines process. So the finance committee at the end of July issues a series of questions to all of the budgeting entities and asks it to respond. And those responses are due in September or October. We went to the finance committee initially in October. And this year they asked us really to focus on strategic issues, uh, which was different than what we had done in the past. And as Stephen mentioned, the process that the finance committee outlined for this guidelines process really was helpful. It really helped focus the discussion. Um, there was a lot of very good feedback that we received. And I can't remember at this point if we came to, to you back um, at the beginning of the fall to, to talk about the strategic issues or not. Um, but we did include that information in the packet. And so the presentation that I'm gonna run through this evening rather quickly is the second presentation that we gave to the finance committee a couple of weeks ago. So the finance committee heard the initial presentations, set a tentative guideline, and then asked us to respond to that. Last week, they also voted their final guideline, and we are still very much in our budget development process. So this is a great opportunity to talk to you about these strategic issues and where we are with the finance committee, because they did not meet 100% of what we asked for. So there's definitely quite a bit of work to do, and some feedback from you would be particularly helpful. So I, I should have been on this slide before. This is really the time frame that we have followed. Again, the town manager issued his budget instructions to departments at the beginning of October. We went to the finance committee very shortly after that, the middle of October, and then they issued a preliminary guideline at the end of October. Our budget requests internally were due back to the town manager November 5th. We have a series of hearings with all of the department managers and that happened around Thanksgiving. And then we had to immediately go back to the finance committee responding to the preliminary guideline. So the, I think we have some work to do on the timetable. Um, town meeting has moved, the budget development process has moved a little bit the last couple of years. I'm not sure we have it quite right just yet, um, but we were able to at least um, get quite a bit of feedback from the departments before we went back to the finance committee. And, and again, last week, they did issue their final guideline. So this here shows a, a snapshot of the town's budget. So the town's budget is really two parts. There's guidelines and there's non-guidelines. So the non-guidelines part of the budget, this is the fixed, all of the fixed costs. And these are fixed costs really for the town and for CPS. So employee benefits for, for both the town and CPS are appropriated under the town's budget in the fixed costs section. Also all of the debt service for the town and, and for CPS is appropriated here as well. And then the guidelines portion, which is the personnel and expense portion of the town budget. And that's what, um, that's what the finance committee really focuses on. Even though we do spend some time talking about the fixed costs, so they, they get an, have an understanding of, of how we're arriving at what dollar amounts are available for the budgets across all three um, budgeting entities. So what we presented to them was a, a total budget of 56.4 million. And that's a, that's a request. Obviously there's a lot of work to do, but in terms of the guidelines sections, um, we were $905,520 over the preliminary guideline based on where we were at this point in time. We then reviewed the strategic issues with them. They asked us to identify four to six strategic issues. We identified four compensation and benefits, infrastructure, governance, and welcoming community. Um, just to look at these just 
very briefly, the compensation and benefits piece. Um, I know the town manager has talked to you before that the uh, salary increases for employees during the pandemic really didn't keep pace with what our peer communities were offering. Um, some of the unions that had negotiated contracts fared slightly better, but in total, we believe that, that salaries did not keep pace even during the pandemic. So that's an issue that we would like to address. On top of that, there are particular targeted positions where we're having a very difficult time filling. Um, some of the ones that, that come to mind uh, immediately it, at the light plant, they are having a particularly difficult issue with line workers. Now that's an enterprise fund budget, so it's not, it's, it's not impacting this budget here, but the town as a whole is having a particularly difficult time there. We also, through the time that I've been here, the positions where we have the most direct competition with the private sector, the engineers, the IT staff, we have a particularly difficult time there as well. And so we had talked to the, to the finance committee about the fact that we'd like to do a full classification and compensation plan. We do have some money that was encumbered. We had hoped to start this during the pandemic, or we didn't hope to start it during the pandemic. We hoped to start it during a fiscal year that, that we had uh, the beginning of the pandemic. So we have that money encumbered and we're looking to to move forward with that plan and hopefully that will address the compensation and benefits piece. In terms of infrastructure, the ask here is to be able to restore the tier one capital back to what our policy targets are, which is two to 3% of the town's budget. And we are far below that, we're, we're less, we're about, eight tenths of 1%. We should be spending close to 2 million. Before the pandemic, we were, we were pretty close to 2 million. And in the current fiscal year, we're down to 800,000. We were at, I believe 1.3 in fiscal 21 and 22, 800,000. We're trying to get back to, to about $2 million and understand that that's gonna take a period of years. It's going to take at least two years question? Yeah, so by tier one and tier two, you mean the same tier one and tier two that we discussed recently about capital projects? Correct. Okay. So here, the, the tier one, these are the, the items that we fund through uh, an annual appropriation where we're paying cash, we're not issuing any debt. Items typically 100,000 or less so our police cruisers, all of our technology, some of the smaller equipment at public works, uh, those types of things are what we're talking about here. But my understanding was tier one was $5 million and above, which you couldn't do. That's three. That's tier, tier, three. tier three is- Tier three, is, three. I'm flipping. Yeah. No, never mind. No, that, Never mind. Sure. And then I put a note in here about tier two. So tier two would be anything over a hundred thousand to under just under five million dollars. These are the things that we fund through our capital improvement plan, and we issue debt, but the debt is within the levy. So in sorry, in the past, um, tier one is sometimes called cash capital, and tier two is sometimes called debt capital. So I'm wondering why we got behind during the pandemic, and I'm just assuming that it was due to the emergency that we had to buy all kinds of plastic um, dividers and we had less revenue coming in and everything like that. So that's why we're, we got behind on tier one and two. So it really has to do with revenue. Yeah. Um, the, during the pandemic, the hit to our local receipts was a loss of about $2 million. Uh, the finance committee was pretty strong in asking the town to maintain all of its services, but also be mindful of the property tax increase and suggested that we take a temporary reduction in the tier one capital as a way to, to get through the loss of revenue. Now in fiscal 23, we're still expecting to be down 
with local receipts. So we're still a little more reliant on property taxes than we would like to be. And um, we know we can't go from 800,000 back to 2 million all at once. So we're, we're hoping that we can do this over a two year period. It might take a little bit longer than that, but there, these are, are things that really need to be replaced. And so we need to be mindful that we can't continue to defer because that's going to take a much longer period of time to recover from. Yeah, it, and, and I think Terry, you said, because we have to do other things. Um, I don't, I don't want to say that all of our kind of emergency response expenses were compensated by FEMA or CARES, but I think a, a large number of them were. Uh, it was, we just didn't levy to do the work because we we reduced the budget as a result of the lost revenues and, and the pandemic as Carrie just noted. So I don't want to create an impression that we spent the same amount of money just on other stuff. We didn't spend the same level of funds uh, out of our operating budget. Okay, thank you. So Carrie, I may be um, preempting what you're gonna say next, but you've um, indicated here on your slide to evaluate the efficacy of the 5% pal uh, policy on tier two. Could you say a little more about that, please? Sure, that's that's where I was hoping, okay, to, hoping to go next. So on an, on an annual basis, we set aside about 5% for the capital that we finance through the issuance of debt. And that has been for the, up until the last couple of years, that really has been a good target. The 5% that's worked very well. This is where we have, uh, we have money appropriated annually for road improvements, for drainage improvements, for fire trucks and ambulances, um, any building improvements, land purchases, that's worked really well. What has happened in the last couple of years is an increased request for funding for public works, for road maintenance, for drainage improvements, for sidewalk improvements. And in this current five year period that we're looking at fiscal beginning fiscal 23, the requests from public works far exceed the, the totality of the plan, just those requests. And, um, the, I don't know who, which one of you is the liaison to the Public Works Commission, but um, if you were at the last meeting, you heard them present their plan and understand the, uh, the amounts of funding that they're looking for. And so this understanding right now, we're working on the middle school, right? We need to, we need to get through the middle school project and get that going. But one of the next things we need to talk about are the tier two projects and is 5% the right target or should we be looking at something else? Because 5% is not going to cut it just for public works. And there is going to be, if there's not increased funding for roads, uh, a marked decrease in the quality of roads, which we don't believe will be acceptable to residents of the town. So that's- Well, and longer term increased expenses yeah. because it's more expensive it's hard, to repair. Yeah. Can um, roads be covered under ARPA? Um, I don't think that uh, there is infrastructure funding, but I think it's more related to um, more equity issues and uh, recovery issues. So if there's an infrastructure project to support economic recovery, uh, that would be, I think, an eligible use. But there is that um, one point or a trillion dollars, I think that was approved by federal government for infrastructure. Now I think it's going to be a little bit of while, a little bit of time before the regulations on how that money can be distributed, you know, to states and then municipalities take shape. But um, we do see that 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 will have, I think, a meaningful impact uh, here in Massachusetts and and in Concord. Um, and so I think help is on the way, I guess, but um, not necessarily through ARPA. Um, so, like I said, some is, but not just not just any infrastructure project. It has to be recovery related. So then the, the next item that we had mentioned or identified as a strategic issue, we called governance. And what we're 
getting at here really is increased support for boards and committees. Um, there are a number of boards and committees that don't have a dedicated staff liaison. Um, there are boards and committees that even that having staff liaisons that the amount of work that needs to be done, making sure that agendas are uh, prepared and, and posted and minutes are prepared and approved timely. We feel that we need some more dedicated resources here. And so that's, that's what we were getting at here. And in the budget, there is an additional staffing request in the town clerk's office, sort of as a starting point to, to uh, further analyze the need and, and make sure that we are on the path to having the adequate level of resources for boards and committees. That's, that's something I, uh, I, I, I feel strongly about. I'm looking at uh, two of the items in the responses from the FinCom. Um, there's uh, uh, on the top three, the uh, on, uh, governance and uh, the strategic issue three. Um, what I would really would not like to see is that future budgets build into them the financial savings that were realized in the last two years by having reduced staff and having vacancies unfilled and having people working from home uh, and that we have a, a broader definition of efficiency in terms of perf performance of town staff where efficiency not only um, uh, not only takes into account the um, the movement of paper and the uh, forms filled out, but also takes into account the um, um, effective uh, communication with uh, residents of the town, and so uh, I think that's a very um, I think that's something that's suffered a lot in the last uh, two years. For various reasons, one of them, of course, has been COVID. But I don't think that I would like to see built into our future budgets those things that we had to suffer through for the last two years because of a, a number of circumstances, including the, the the disease. I don't know if how much how how many people agree with me on that, but I think it's it's, it's something I think that's extremely important. Well. Uh I certainly don't agree with that. And I will tell you that um, the, we don't, we, we kept the services level as Carrie said in her introduction, um, the demands have increased significantly, which is why we now believe that we have to address uh, the resource question because of the level of demand that has gone up um, because of new, newer boards and committees, greater expectations, greater engagement, all of that takes time. And I think, um, Town employees do a great many things to support the needs of residents of communities far beyond moving paper around. And I think we have an excellent workforce that is highly efficient and highly dedicated. And so I, I take exception to the characterization that there has been inefficiency um, during the past two years, especially during the pandemic. People worked harder than they probably ever have. Well, one of the things I would, one of the comments that was made one of the comments that was made was <clears throat> that we have uh, too many committees and that they overlap in function. But one of the functions that committees serve, which is an, you know, kind of an intangible but very important thing, is that it involves citizens in the government of the town. And <clears throat> that has a fun of an extremely valuable function in and of itself. Um, and the, I think in many ways, the more people who live in this town, we can get involved in our, um, our social and governmental activities. That is uh, something you can't measure in money. Well, I agree with that. But, but there is never a, less to, a cost to that. Well, um, I, I'm just going to say that um, the trade-off, Henry, is how much taxpayers are willing to spend for support staff because... We want to have the transparency. We want to follow the open meeting law. And um, we want to support the committees. And the committees are hardworking and they want a lot of data. 
and we need enough staff to help them with the data. So we, there's a trade-off. But that's, I think that's a matter of leadership. I right. mean, certainly we respect <clears throat> the wishes of the voters who uh, have, have an eye out for what things cost, at least with right. regard to certain things. But I think we, 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 and we don't ignore that, but I think we can provide the leadership in really, um, you know, being an example and, and making it clear to people that there are many intangible values. Absolutely. That, uh, and those things do have a cost and they may be worth, they may be worth more than filling a few potholes. Right. There's always a lot of trade-offs mm -hmm. to be done. Susan? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, the other uh, constraint, I guess, about the number of boards and committees is filling the seats and not just going back to the same group of uh, volunteers over and over again. You're absolutely right. And that's something we can address, but that's not, that's, I think that's a different issue. It is, but it's, it's all part and parcel of having a robust, heavily involved citizenry in town government. But, well, but the support that we give the boards and committees does have an impact on being able to recruit people to serve on them. So it's, um, I think we have to look at both sides of it. Right, I think you're both right. And the example is we have some new committees like DEI and transportation. Um, they have some really new folks on them. I think everybody pretty much on those committees is new. Um, and they are needing some staff support. So you're both making good points and, and you know, it's really something we're gonna have to wrestle with. Uh, Carrie, go ahead. Sure, and then the last strategic issue that we identified, uh, we're calling welcoming community. Um, and here we've identified affordable housing, access to public transportation. Both of those things are not really operational budget issues, but um, part of, of the concept here, and then access to supportive services. And that that is an actual budget request out of um, our human services department looking for some additional funding to be able to provide um, services to members of the community that might need help, more help than we're able to provide in accessing other um, social service agencies, particularly we were talking about the need for um, brain health, that it is often difficult to get into see a provider, there's a waiting period. People may need some supportive services while they're waiting, and perhaps there's something more that we could do as a stopgap measure, and that's something um, that is an operational budget item that we're looking to fund. Matt? So while I don't disagree with any of the, the things that are put under welcoming community, I also felt that last year there was a consultant that came in and did a project around diversity, equity, and inclusion, working with senior management. But I wondered if one potential outcome of that process would be that going forward in FY23, we would continue to have diversity, equity, and inclusion as a strategic issue for the town. I believe it, it is. I don't think it's a project you went in and did one time and it would be done. And so I wish I had seen diversity, equity, and inclusion as a bullet point under welcoming community. And I mean, I don't know that we're at the point of hiring a DEI director, but that we do have at least some budget towards that specific objective um, that's enshrined in the, in the town, you know, is operations. Um, the, I don't see anything there. You're talking the, about uh, a bunch of recruitment. Uh, well, either a consultant, no. consultant or, uh, okay. you know, staff time or training uh, or, you know, there, all I saw uh, was uh, overtime for police. Right, let's give an answer. So uh, I, I, I believe there is money, I believe, in the HR department to continue our relationship with our uh, DEIB advisor, because you're right, Matt, that process is not a completed training, you know, uh, and we're done. It's an ongoing, it's an ongoing um, 
it's an ongoing effort, uh, including developing a philosophy and organizational philosophy, and then creating a roadmap to move forward to, to increase diversity, uh, make sure that we're equitable and inclusive and, uh, and, and are an employer where people belong. But I wanna separate the DEIB work we're doing organizationally and the community work. They're both very, very impor important and both need to be done, but they're different. They're different chapters of the same book, I guess I would say. Uh, but no, I, I believe it's in the HR department. We are, we are including funds to continue that work. Okay. I just think it would be great to add to the strategic issues. And, and yeah, I would like to see what those uh, spending priorities are. Did you say the HR department? Uh, I, I think so. I think we need to include it in, a, in the HR department. I can confirm there is funding in the HR department that's new specifically to advance this initiative. Okay. And point well taken. I was just going to update it as we were talking because. Okay. Uh, we could start by uh, hiring a So on this next slide, this is um, our fiscal 23 budget spending drivers categorized um, in four different areas. So this is if we were to fund everything that, that we felt that we had to with new money, rather than looking for some efficiencies or any adjustments in other parts of the budget, it would be almost $1.9 million, 6.5%. Five four percent. So obviously that's too much, um, but just to, to see how this money would be divided, the wage adjustments, $970,000. I do think we're going to refine and reduce that number somewhat, but this is where we were at this point in time. Um, increased utility costs. Uh, we wouldn't normally make note of this, but for the cost increases are very significant much more than we would see in a typical year. Um, in total, about $164,000 across the general fund. And I've identified um, the percent increases. I think the, the most notable, well, they're all very notable, but the cardboard recycling program, this is a program that we have been able to offer. Um, and there was no charge associated with it before. It was just part of our contract. Now there is a charge for it, and it's it's fairly significant. I believe it's about fifty thousand dollars, and this is this is a service I think that residents have come to uh, appreciate. I think with people home, they're ordering more, and they have more cardboard to get rid of on a regular basis. So we want to maintain that. Our solid waste contract was up for renewal, and we are seeing significant increases there. That is a long term contract, but it is up quite a bit over what, uh, what we had in the last contract. So addressing the strategic issues, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. We identified that at about $227,000. And then the tier one funding, we had originally hoped to go from 800 up to 1.3, and then maybe in the second year, get closer to 2 million. So we were seeking $500,000 or that that increase was $500,000. This here is a slide that the finance committee asked us to put together. So the guidelines request is in the middle column, $30,990,000. Uh, the difference between the preliminary guideline and what we were asking for at this point was $905,000. I don't think I mentioned the preliminary guideline. It was a 2.7% increase, just under $800,000, which is what was uh, allocated by the Finance Committee back in October. On the bottom of the slide, this is the Finance Committee's sustainable growth rate, which they calculated for fiscal 23 as 2.34%. And how do they calculate that number? I saw the two things, the CPI and- Yeah, it is- but, What, do they blend them or- It is, it is a, a weighted blending of, um, of the two, of the, of the CPI, the regional CPI and the 10-year the treasury yield. And I just looked up the regional CPI for November of 2021. Mm -hmm. 
And the year over year inflation rate is 5.3%. So, and, and of course, the treasury rates have gone up as well. So that number is really already out of date. Yeah, and, and they did note that they calculated that in July, and that's according to their policy. They do that every July. They did acknowledge in the the final guideline letter that was issued today that that number is out of date. Yeah, we're in an extraordinary time of change in, in inflation. And um, I just think that if you go back and you look at the proposed compensation increases. Now, realizing that we do have cases where we have more senior people rolling off, people coming in at the lower part of their, their range and all of that, that it's still a modest increase when you consider that in order to just stay even with inflation, one needs about a 5% bump in, in salary nowadays. Um, and so that's we're, we're in for a new kind of time when it comes to budgeting. And then, yeah, I, sorry, go ahead, Carrie. I, I was just going to say that the particular difficulty is we're still down on local receipts. And so it's really a balancing act between we're a little more reliant on property tax than we should be because of yep. the economy and we have the middle school project. And uh, But isn't like 90% of our income from residential real estate? Or is that just... It is, and so we are we are ever so slightly more reliant on on property taxes. But we're we're still down, expecting to be down about a million dollars in local receipts in fiscal twenty three. So it's significant. But is the sustainability of that sustainable growth rate is that based on our our anticipated ability to realize income? Is that what makes it sustainable? <clears throat> It's the, I mean, that's the finance committee's metric and it's based on a lot of, it's based on a, several factors. Um, one of them is the consumer price index, which, you know, I think there are inflationary measuring sticks that could be used for municipal operations. I, I don't necessarily agree that the CPI is one of them. And I've talked to finance committee members about this in the past, but I do think having some kind of metric that really captures how much the annual tax uh, growth should be each year is, is, um, it is important, but as Matt noted, it's been really a, a alt a game change in a couple of years. And now with inflation, um, how does the SGR really capture where we are today? And I think as Carrie noted, the finance committee is is thoughtful to and sensitive about um, that issue. Um, and I think um, that that that's one of the reasons why you know wages are need to be increased and there there is increasing a pressure on that but i mean i think ultimately it's decisions made at town meeting that drive the growth of expenditures um you know for the community the, the finance committee spent a long time and terry you probably remember this because maybe it started when you were still on the finance committee but they spent a long time trying to come up with a metric and this is the metric that they're using. Um, but the, the guidelines chair provided a lot of other metrics that he thought would also be helpful. And I think, I think it was helpful for the finance committee and, and they were able to come up with uh, a guideline that was, that's higher than their SGR. So here, this is a, uh, a snapshot of our request, fiscal 23, the preliminary budget request uh, versus the preliminary guideline. And we've, we've broken this out between operating and the tier one capital, which we wouldn't normally do, but because there's such a, a, de uh, a um, gap between what was appropriated in the current year versus what we were asking, we thought this would be helpful. Um, again, I, over here, this is the, the $900,000 gap that we were talking about. And we're saying 500,000 of that is from the tier one capital, 405,000 from operating. On the operating side, we have 
services that the general fund provides on behalf of enterprise funds and other special revenue funds. And we charge for those services. So payroll and oversight and administration and accounts payable, those sort of things. We charge the enterprise funds. Uh, we had a placeholder amount when we started the budget process of $1.9 million. And when all of the requests came through and we calculated the, the chargebacks to the enterprise funds, the chargebacks are 205,000 higher than our placeholder. So we're reducing that from the 905,000 uh, Delta. So we went back to the finance committee and said, we are looking for some additional consideration in the amount of $700,000, 500,000 in tier one capital, 200,000 in operating. Do we have a reasonable expectation that while we can't know all the rules around the infrastructure bill spending, that we will be able to recoup some of that $500,000 at least through FY23 infrastructure bill payments from the federal government? I guess uh, I would answer that by saying um, we wouldn't, I guess if recouping it versus spending the new infrastructure money on the many unmet infrastructure needs, you know, it, it, you know, I, I think that the community would probably expect us to make greater investments in infrastructure rather than recoup our, what is our programmed policy driven annual contributions. But we're um, talking about a net increase here of 62% in this year. So it almost seems like we are taking on new um, kind of objectives. But I think it's because, because I think of the, it's not, a, it's not a run rate from year to year. I mean, you were saying that it's underfunded, but. Well, it was at 2 million. So, uh, so they're trying to go back up to the 2 okay. million. Well, and the other thing, and, and you all know this, the stuff we didn't do is more expensive today than it was when we programmed for it, you know, two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I was going to say, Matt, you made a point about this, um, staff changes and things like that. Um, there is attrition every year. Um, and a lot of times when the town has, you know, free cash at the end of the year, some of that is, is often due to attrition, but we don't budget necessarily for attrition because we don't know what necessarily individual individuals are going to do during the fiscal year. Uh, so I want to just clarify for, I, I know you know that, but just for everybody else, the, um, um, we don't like have an attrition savings kind of built in on, uh, because we usually don't know when we're planning a budget, who's retiring, who's leaving, who's coming in, that, that type of thing. But uh, attrition does often materialize uh, by the end of the year. So then this is the last slide. Um, and this is sort of a more granular um, information on, on what that $700,000 is comprised of. And we tied, the, these are in priority order um, and they're tied to the strategic initiatives that we identified at the beginning of the presentation. So the first is the salary reserve. Uh, we're looking for an additional $178,000 here to fund, to fully fund the salary reserve. And that's, that is reflected in that $900,000 number that I showed you a couple of slides ago. The next two are related to elections. So now that we have two districts, we have additional expenses associated with elections, everything from ballots and, and programming. Um, and then we have- Oh, two... just send that bill to the legislature. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, an, an unfunded mandate. Mm -hmm. um, and then in fiscal 23, we, we have two a state and a state primary and the final state election as well. Um, we have some additional costs in census. Uh, we're going to outsource the printing. I know these are small dollars, but um, that is a new expense. And then five here, this is town clerk, board and committee staff support. So this is the position that we talked about or the funding that we talked about fairly extensively already. And that's about $45,000. And that would be for a new full-time position. So when you say, I mean, again, these small dollars, but outsourcing the printing, isn't that going to be a net savings? 
you're just saying because today you do it in-house, you right. don't see it as a line item, so therefore, but. Right, and that that's something in government budgeting that we don't do a great job quantifying the costs of things that we do with in-house staff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the sixth item is in planning and land management. This is a transportation planner. And I think there, there's probably some discussion that you would like to have about that position. Stephen, is this one that you would like to? Yeah, I, just very briefly, I, you know, and I think I mentioned this at finance committee, you know, uh, it is currently in, it was in the request from DPLM and um, I support the need for someone dedicated to and transportation being a catch-all term but i do think the role needs to be shared in some way shape or form between uh the police department and cpw specifically our, our engineering department and perhaps um, human services it just we just haven't defined that yet so this this um this amount of money and the position and is is kind of I don't say a placeholder. I think the town should definitely move forward and hire somebody to kind of overall coordinate transportation initiatives. But it's not just limited to planning. There's uh, and you know the police do a lot of things with kind of speed measurement and enforcement, uh, parking, um, and then there's like I said the engineering department for planning for construction things like that. Plus safe routes to school and there's a whole bunch of things. And having one person kind of be a clearinghouse for all that and a coordinator is is good. Right now the like I said the request is nested in in, in DPLM, but I, I I certainly don't view this as only a planning position and i think that the budget should when, when if, if it's approved at town meeting um operationally hopefully it will be a little more all encompassing uh, uh, so my question about that stephen is if you're saying things that are currently being done by the police department or dpw um there's no offset to, I mean, are there budgets decreasing? I mean, how do you justify another 71,000 if those tasks are just being done, but they're not being coordinated? Well, there's there's stuff that, that isn't being done. Um, and, I should, I, and I guess, I think we've talked a lot um, at the Transportation Advisory Committee and elsewhere about the need to take a comprehensive approach towards transportation because it's such a huge issue. Um, but there isn't one person who is responsible for taking that broad view of transportation uh, and, all, and the many facets of it here in, that impact our local community. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's basically a decentralized role to a number of existing positions that also have a, a full-time job you know, on top of that. And so I do think it's, I think this is really to do more in the, in the transportation sphere, um, not just take on work that's already being done by others. It, it's to coordinate the work being done by others, but also um, do more in terms of planning, uh, you know, community engagements, um, policy development, things like that. That's, that. I guess that that's how I view it. I know that's how uh, Marsha Rasmussen viewed it, but I also, like I said, I think there are um, linkages to other departments that, that need to be made. Thank you. Um, I agree and uh, about that, um, being the liaison on transportation um, committee. For example, the Crosstown Connect, um, we don't have a van service going through town like other towns do. Why not? Well, we don't have anybody to work on it to get us a van to try to find a grant for a van or donate a van or you know there's no I understand that I just what I heard Stephen talking about was stuff that was already being done and I recognize that there needs to be there needs to be resources to support things like Crosstown Connect and other transportation initiatives right and there's no one person who's assigned to be working on that now I would support this position just simply because Again, with that infrastructure bill, we're likely to have projects that we're going to need to plan in order to make use of those funds. So I, I think good it's point. a good moment to be looking at this. But I follow up with my previous uh, question that I wanted to ask, which is it's hard to evaluate all these positions for me 
without getting a broader sense of our staffing and and costs relative to peer towns. I just think, you know, for a municipal government, how are we staffing and deploying? And there are some things that are probably unique to our culture and that were reflected in that, but I'd still like to get a just a general sense of, okay, here is sort of a model town, here's where Concord is and re relative to peers. And, and here's the reasons why we're making these decisions versus that. So I, you know, again, from a policy perspective, that's where me as a board member, I would really like to get better insight. I see Carrie nodding. Um, Carrie, do you have a way to have that information get put together from peer communities? Um, it is not an urgent request, right, uh, I should say. I, <laughs> I'm um, I'm taking notes for next year when we do this process better than um, we have in the past. We do have the um, the benchmarking database that is that you can get to on our website. Um, open uh, clear, like clear that gov. has a tax rate and the uh, number it, of residents and uh, it does median have house value and. It has um, it has spending by category, so you could compare uh, public work spending or police spending. Yeah, I have. And before. we don't make great use of that. I think we should make better use of it. But the data is often outdated, and it's not if like if we account for an expense within our <laughs> transportation, a transport some element of transportation planning in the police department. And yeah. Lexington has it in their land management department. It's it's very hard to to make those comparisons, and I think that's why we don't spend a lot of time promoting it. But we <clears throat> certainly could make better use of it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, they're at the bottom of, of the town budget and the tax rates. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but well, it's it's more complicated than that. I mean, the bottom line isn't even the bottom line in some cases because we have. Uh, enterprise fund employees. We've got revolving fund employees. I mean, not not many towns run a fitness center or a broadband business. I mean, to, to ask the question, how many town employees are there? It it's a it ends up being a pretty complicated answer. And I think Matt, to your point, it, it'd be you. There probably is some benchmarking, but then I would add the number of we have talked about this. Uh, the number of boards and committees in a, in a town versus our community and, and the we level of quirks. We just need to account for them. Yeah. Well, Karen, you had the courage, I think, in one of the uh, little essays you wrote a couple of years ago about having contemplated zero-based budgeting, didn't you? Sure, zero-based budgeting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think we do that on a on a regular basis. I don't I don't think it's um, we're not talking about it all all of the time and promoting it, but it's certainly something that we are doing on a regular basis. Uh, but there's obviously, there's always room for, for improvement and it's helpful to receive your feedback because it um, gives us an idea of when we should be starting this with you going forward. So I, um, I appreciate that. Very briefly, getting back to um, Matt's point about the transportation planner. I have really mixed feelings because I'm a big proponent of fiscal sustainability and I don't want the budget to grow so fast that people move out of town. And on the other hand though, when you were talking Matt, I realized that if these government grants are gonna be coming in, it's possible that similar to the sustainability director, the person might end up, the salary might get paid for just by you know the grants that we can take in and we'll have those programs. So you know, that's something to consider, yeah. I had another point, which is just again, for next year's process, the those strategic priorities, if I think of the one thing that our board should be involved in is helping to set those, I think actually they're very good ones. Right. So I'm fine with this year's, but yeah. if we could get in the loop on that, I think that's where, yeah, we, we have the most to say, I would say. Absolutely, and we're gonna be doing that for ARPA um at an upcoming focus meeting because i think our role is not to micromanage you know right. every single line item but to give some policy priorities 
And then the last two items here, these are our larger DEI initiatives for fiscal 23, in addition to the funding we had talked about in the human resources department that's across the organization. So this is in, in public safety in the police department, um, $20,000 for some overtime for additional DEI training. Um, anytime public safety, because they're operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, anytime we're doing any training there, it requires overtime because we have to bring people in to fill the shifts. Um, the, the, in the police department, it's, it's really um, just a broad, broad based training. In the fire department, their training is more targeted at new hires. And this is a project I was talking to to Linda, I think, and probably getting pretty animated about this because I, I think this is really a, a phenomenal idea. Um, we have a history of hiring firefighters and requiring that they have their firefighter one, two certification, which is a state certification. Um, and it's, it's the entry level training for firefighters and Concord as a desirable community has had the ability to make that as a minimum requirement. The problem with that is in order to get into that training program, you have to be affiliated with the community. So you either have to have been hired by somebody else and you're not looking to, to come here right away, or you have to have some way of being affiliated with a fire department. So in communities that have call departments or a combination of full-time and, and call service, so more rural communities, you can as a resident volunteer to be part of the call service and you can go through the training program. But if you are in a more urban community, they're not going to have a call fire department and you won't have access to participate in that training. And so that limits, if we're saying you have to have firefighter one, two, that limits the pool of applicants and is um, particularly limiting to people coming from urban areas. So this last round of hiring, we hired three firefighters. We didn't have that requirement and, and looked for the best candidate and said we would create an in-house training program to bring people up to the, the level of training that they should have that we had from, from other recruits coming in. Doesn't the police department hire people and then send them to the state police academy? They, they do, yes, they, they, they can, um, but I would imagine that we also are, have been fairly fortunate here and been able to get um, certified police officers as well. So in this round of, of hiring three, there was one candidate who did not have the firefighter one, two certification, but was still hired because that person was deemed one of the most qualified from, from that pool. So this is, this is a, a way to create, uh, to allow this opportunity for people who might not have had access to it. And so I think this is, it's, it's a real interesting program and it's, it's very unique and, and groundbreaking because other communities aren't, aren't doing that. So I just have a question. Uh, if a person has an association with the community and they can go to get this certification from the state, who pays for that? Well, that, that would be up to the community, whether or not they, they were paying for, for that training. If Stephen, I, I don't know if you know, honestly, I can't remember for, for fire service, if, if there is a fee, I know there is for police. For, for which I, could, I couldn't hardly hear Susan's question, I'm sorry. Is there a cost associated with the uh, fire academy training, fire service? I, I no, uh, I think I believe fire service. Um, it, I, I believe the state pays for the fire uh, academy training. I thought that that was a good. I know. I know one of them is paid for by the. Um, uh, you know, it may be you, it may be the police department. You, there, there may be a cost associated with fire department training. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's one it's one or the other. <laughs> I think in the same. I can't remember which one it is. So uh, again, the additional 
consideration request that we made to the finance committee was for 200,000 for operating, 500,000 for capital, a total of 700,000. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the finance committee voted the final guideline last Thursday and they allocated an additional 250,000. So we are still 450,000 off of the, um, the final guideline. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Um, are there further questions? Linda? I do have, since we were talking about the fire safety and uh, the police department, you know, we've had several substantial gifts this year and uh, every year we have gifts uh, directed to the police department or the fire department. And I guess I'm wondering how that gets factored into existing expenses that they've built into the budget. So is, you know, are these, you know, substantial gifts then offsets? Yeah. Yeah. So the gifts that we have received have been for capital purchases. Um, the most recent was for the um, electric cruiser. And we have also received funds for bulletproof vests and some other equipment. So it's really, it's for capital. And we certainly do take that into account and would reduce the capital request based on the availability of gift funds. So there was one um, substantial gift uh, on our consent agenda a couple months ago, which didn't specify a uh, capital uh, request, but that doesn't mean that it didn't come attached with that, I guess is what I'm hearing. Is that the public safety one? Yeah. I think that was for capital, if I'm remembering. Is my... it from Middlesex yes. schools? Yeah, their their requests, uh, their gifts are for capital. Well, purchases. this was from an individual or individuals in town. Oh, that's a different one. Yeah. yeah. There was one private, there was a private gift and that was for the electric cruiser, for the electric right? Cruiser. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, that, so they may all be uh, designated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Thank you. This is very, uh, very clear and very enlightening. Okay, so Thank Carrie, how difficult is it going to be? I guess Carrie and uh, Stephen, how difficult is it going to be to close that gap at this point? Um, I have total confidence in Carrie's ability to make that happen. <laughs> with our and, magic pen, huh? And, and I was going to say, it's going to be a little difficult. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we sharpened our pencil, so to speak, to get down to the $700,000. Um, I do hope that we will be able to meet the guideline. That is the intention, but it is, it is going to be difficult. We have the... Uh, the library expansion project coming online, we have additional staff associated with that. As we mentioned, we feel that we're behind in compensation and want to, to get back on track with capital. And so I, we definitely have some work to do and I, could, I can't tell you right now exactly how we're going to do it, but we're going to have to get there pretty fast. Yeah. Well, you just uh, increase your forecasted revenues from future sales. Mm -hmm. That's how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a question. So in, in the big picture, if there's some, if the schools are under by 700, that would, that would work, but that's not likely to happen. Is that, I mean, the whole, because you're looking at the whole, Right, at, at this point in time, all three of the cost centers, town, CPS, CCRSD, are over the guideline. Okay. By, uh, um, by close to what we are as well. So it, this might this be a year when we do an operating override? I mean, no. probably not. No, not with the middle school. Not with the I middle school, so. but. Well, and we don't, we don't need an override, we're still, projected to be about four and a half percent under the levy, but the, the property tax, the estimated property tax associated, increase associated with the guideline is 3.35%. And as we get closer to town meeting, that probably will come down 
but the last few years we've been under two and a half percent and I don't expect in 23 we'll be under two and a half percent so that with the middle school it, it's it's a big ask yeah I mean I think the other thing is just to put some perspective on it, what was the amount of guidelines spending in the budget because I think you know we're the, the amount of money we're off compared to the overall is you know I think it, it's pretty close um, it will be difficult. There are going to be difficult decisions to be made, but I, I think it's a good starting, a good starting point to um, go into the public hearings with. Okay. Well, I'm sure you'll be back, um, and we'll be continuing to discuss the budget, Carrie. So, thank you very much. Um, okay, and we're going to move on now to our next item, which is to meet with the personnel study task force to discuss amending their charge. And I see Ruth Lauer, one of the co-chairs is here. If you wanna join us at the table, Ruth. And I think that the other co-chair, Ann Rarick is, yes, Ann is participating by Zoom. Okay, great. I'm here. Hi, Ann. So uh, Ruth and Ann, and um, Susan and Liaison and I um, met, um, I don't remember what day, yesterday or the <laughs> day before. Um, and we tried to talk through what the issues are. And we had a series of meetings. And then at 4.30 today, Susan and I had to leave your meeting, Ruth and Ann, but I think right before we left, we did have a consensus Yes. And where we're at. So, um, Ruth, since you're here, do you want to talk about sure. that? Okay. Sure. I think we had an eventful meeting uh, at the at the task force and and at our elbows on the table discussion amongst the the chairs uh, on the charge. And as I described to the task force, we added words and we deleted words and we reordered words and we came up with something that um, people were supportive of, of at the task force. And at the last minute, we added a sentence. No, mm -hmm. at the last minute, we clarified a sentence, which um, I'm sure that you have the charge in your packet so that if I could just draw your eyes to um, duties and responsibilities. Section D. Section D and number three. It was, it was felt that there was ambiguity and perhaps the language that was in the, the charge that hit your desk was open to being too expansive. And at the table, we came up with the following sentence, three. In accomplishing the goals above, the task force will keep in mind that the town's personnel system seeks to be colon, and the list then remains the same. The notion was we wanted to ensure that this perfect personnel board system that's being created for the future would do all of those things, but that the task force would not be doing all of those things. So would you read that opening sentence again, yes, please? I will do that. Number three. <clears throat> so Terry, D3. Right, I'm just wondering if there's anyone that can share the screen. So, because I think it's very confusing if we're not looking at it because it was a different number three and it's not uh, on Zoom, otherwise I would. Okay. Right. And do you have a way to share the screen or? Um... I, I did not get it from Claude. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I'm the only one who got it then. Okay. Oh, I'm powerful. Okay. Harry can maybe do it. All okay. Right. Are you ready? <clears throat> Ta -da. So start with the charge. Yes, <laughs> there are only 42 iterations of it. 
Definitely. <laughs> At least 42. And, you know, the, the perception of the whole discussion was the task force would be fine. I think um, it's also necessary to say that sections A, B, C, and E are unchanged. Is unchanged. That, right. We're only talking about D Everything right now. that's on your desk is unchanged except for one sentence. I'm sorry, sweetie. Yeah. So we're on D. So I could now share from the what we got in our packet. If you oh, like. that Aren't you? Cool. Okay. That would be really good. Then we could talk about blue, green, and purple. But <laughs> it is. Uh, oh, gosh. There, oh. It's uh, pretty much of an eye test. So we have to have let me just see if the I red line it. copy. That is, but we have to just expand it bigger. Sorry, I just want to try to make it. Hopefully, that's better. Ah, beautiful. There we go. So there's three. So it, presently, it was saying just ensure that the personnel system is, and then it gives these list of things, yes. and you're you're qualifying that, and you're just saying, well, there was recognize some... that the town wants it to be, da, da, da. Yeah, not not that the board, not that your board is assigning us to do that, but right. that that. But you're creating the conditions under which it could be. This yeah. will be a perfect board. Okay. Ideal, yeah. In the <laughs> ideal world. Okay, so read, read the, your sentence again. So, Matt, you ready to go? <clears throat> Number three. In accomplishing the goals above, yep. comma, the task force will keep in mind that the town's personnel system seeks to be colon, A through F. Keep in mind that it seeks to be. Yeah, 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 hey, hey. <laughs> you want iteration number 44, do you? Well, I just. And, yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay, wait a minute. In accordance with the goals above. As it, as it, in, accomplishing. In, accomplishing. Oh, in accomplishing the goals above, the task force will keep in mind that what was it? The town's personnel system, no longer administration, seeks to be colon A through F. Does everyone have that? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, were, were you typing that on the screen? No, I was not. Right. Was I supposed to? I mean, it's no? in the PDF file, so. Oh. Um, I mean, I can't type in a PDF. Oh, yeah. so, oh sure so you can. can. I requested yeah. that. Please send it in writing. Okay. In okay. So I think so. I think we all understand what that says, right? Right. Yeah. And we all understand that it's your responsibility to decide. We just. Yeah. However, your committee, your task force is on board with all of these changes, including the one that you just read, right? Right. Very, very minimal changes, actually, right. exactly. compared to what went on. I, I think it's fine. I think don't think we had any problem. Well, I don't think we had any problem with the charge. The, the problem that I became aware of, and you can confirm or deny was that um <clears throat> henry just hold that thought for a minute let's finish the thought charge holding. i'm still holding a thought now okay thank you <laughs> it's um, painful hold that for a minute let's just finish the charge and then we can talk about this other issue so is there any more discussion from the select board on this all right is there I mean, I'm, I'm not very happy with the wording but given the circumstances and that there's consensus on the committee or the task force, then I'm I yield to them, and it's harmless, right? That's it that's doesn't my weaken feeling. anything, does it? Or well, it, it, anything? I mean, I was hoping that the task force 
would take steps to ensure that our personnel system is efficient. But if they're yes. just going to keep in mind that the that they intend for it to be, it sounds very wishy washy to me. But you know, it, it's okay if that's what you're really going to do is to work on a more efficient system. That's that's what we want. It's it's going to be whatever they do, pretty much. Well, true, but. But I think that the differentiation, if I can speak to this, um, is that that the job of the task force is primarily to look at the bylaw and the future role of the personnel board and not to ensure that the person, they, they're not, part of their charge is not to dive into each of these uh, A through F. Um, no, but it's to create a bylaw and a. But to, and so that's why that language was changed because that was one of the interpretations. But they need to look at those things to see whether they're working and how you make them work. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So, anyway, I, 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 I can make a motion. Okay. Great. So. Move to approve the amended charge of the personnel study uh, bylaw study task force as amended verbally this evening through Ruth Lauer's um, statement. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you so much for thank all you. the time. All oh, no, don't go away and, because um, I've, been, I've been holding a thought. Yes, oh, yes, I forgot. I've been holding thought. a thought, yeah. and you know how painful that is. <laughs> First of all, having a thought is painful, <laughs> holding it is almost impossible. Uh, I had I had some people had been talking to me that the task force was having difficulties. Uh, the, obtaining the information from town staff that they thought was essential to carrying out their function, whatever that function was. And so it, if that is the case, um, then I think we may need to go a little bit further in finding a way to direct uh, town staff to provide you with the, with the information that you need to do your job. So I'd like to hear what you have to say about that, and then we'll move on from there. Okay, thank you. Moving forward, we think, we the task force think that communication is going to be crucial for us. There might have been some you know, wrinkles, but moving forward, it's, it's my belief, not, I'm, I don't wanna speak for the task force, here, but it's my belief that the Board of Selectmen could help us a lot by making sure that staff know that we exist. Because I don't think, given all of the issues that you're dealing with, that staff is dealing with, the time of the year, the budget, all of these things, people are keeping their heads down, they're getting their job done. They're not aware that the task force is out there and it would be lovely that we don't surprise them. If, you know, if we should need something, we don't want to first have to explain who we are and why. It seems to me that if the selectmen, I'm sorry. Board, you go board. If the board could make it known that the task force is there and there might be a need for information from said department heads, SMTs, who, whoever. I don't know. We don't know ourselves. Right now, we are focused on the stakeholders and the resources. And, and we have plans to interview those folk. And it would be smooth mm -hmm. if they anticipate it. That's a very good point. And I know, I know Linda wants to speak in a minute, but I'm really glad you brought that up, Ruth, because um, I've been working with Stephen and with Carrie, and we're trying to figure out exactly how and where to draw the line. And it's gonna be Carrie's call 
but probably the first week of January, um, Carrie and I will both be talking about whatever she decides. Mm -hmm. And it'll be something for all committees and all citizens to know, especially the select board. But it will be some kind of rule like if a document exists, it's already in the public domain. Sure. It's already on the website. It's in a town report. Here it is. If I as staff have to create a whole new report for you, well, I'm going to have to check with my supervisor or the town manager because it's going to take me a few hours or days. For days. Yeah. So we're going to try to address that issue head on because I, you're not the only committee dealing with that. True. I have the same issue with the transportation committee. Um, maybe with DEI, there's, we just heard Stephen and Carrie talking about the need for more staff support for the committees. So it's a very important issue. And I thank Henry and Ruth for addressing it. And Carrie and I will talk some more and we'll continue to address it. But let me make one point out of that. I think that a, our board and any committee should be in no worse a position with regard to obtaining information than the citizen who files a freedom of information request. Correct. And so, and anybody can file that, anybody can ask for any information that's available. And you know, with certain issues that we've been dealing with, people have bombarded the town with all kinds of very burdensome requests and we've responded because we have to and so i don't see why a town committee should be in a worse position than a citizen acting under the freedom of information Absolutely act Absolutely correct <laughs> however the freedom of information act says that you do not have to invent a document if it doesn't exist then you can't provide it you don't provide it and and the same with the citizen committee. Um, in, in fact, the citizen committee might eventually get that document when the staff person has time to do it, but they're not going to just invent it on the spot if, for a FOIA or for any other reason. Um, Linda was next and then Susan. Well, I think you basically addressed this issue. I think it's something that needs to be worked out with um, the new town manager and, and yourself. And But there are, um, we're all aware of this. There's incredible um, uh, pressure on all of our employees to meet their work obligations and the objectives that have been set up for their own departments. In addition, they're trying to staff the committees Many of them are doing an excellent job and make every single effort um, to provide the information that the committees are needed. There is a new burden, however, and I can speak to this personally with some new committees uh, that are just getting started where a great deal of information is needed up front, and that puts on uh, uh, additional burden not only on the new committee or task force, uh, but also on the staff that may be uh, trying to assist in good faith those committees. So um, I'm glad to hear that you and um, Carrie are going to be talking about this and working this out. But I think that there are some realities that the town manager is dealing with as well in terms of the staff responsibilities. And I think we've got to be aware of that. Right. So this will be an agenda item on January 3rd. We're, 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 we're well aware. Let of me it. just throw in one more thought. And that's a minute. Just, just a minute. Next, I'd then, like to then we, if something. we create a committee, well, we should do, just do a moment, it. Please. Minute. Susan was next, then. Yeah, um, hold your thought again. I sorry. just, yeah, tr I know it's painful, but um, <laughs> I, I recall when I first, right after the election, I was elected to the select board, had a meeting with the then chair. And one of the first things he said is, you are not to go to, directly to town staff. You go through the town manager who normally says, yeah, go ahead. But it, you, you don't have unfettered access, even as a select board member, to departments. It's, it's, it's not how we've done it. And I know you have a different point of view on it, but we'll figure it out. Right, because it undermines the town manager's authority. You know, if you, if you go around them like that, it's, it makes it very complicated for the staff when they have several bosses. 
Terry, can, can I make a comment about this too? Uh, sure, but Henry was next and then-, then uh, All I want to say is that if we create a committee to, to accomplish a task, the board should give that committee or that task force the resources they need to do the job we ask them to do. So I, I let me say this. Let me lead with the idea that town staff that interface with boards and committees all want to provide support to the boards and committees that they that they are that they are that they interact with that they interface with, and so that's always our goal. And um, I will say that the, the the resources that we're talking about are under the you know are under the responsibility of the town manager but the point is it less who has the responsibility and more what is the outcome we want to achieve um within you know within those responsibilities and i think we all everyone wants to provide good support because i think town staff does value the role that citizens provide in, in the government by virtue of their volunteerism on boards and committees however um, suggesting that the board, a board or committee shouldn't be in a worse position than someone doing an open records request means that town staff are then in a worse position. Because oftentimes when we receive burdensome requests, it's because um, there's a, a wide net gets cast because perhaps the requester isn't really sure what they're looking for or thinks there's something there that really isn't. And that is, as you said, um, burdens. Whereas Boards and committees usually either know what they want, are looking for, or have an idea of where they want to get to. And that's where working with town staff to make sure that the, the right questions are being asked, or the right, info, I shouldn't say the right questions, but the right information is being pursued is really important because you talked about efficiency. That's how you get to efficiency, by making sure we're not unnecessarily creating new documents or chasing down um, documents that may not be related to the particular charge or goals or, you know, or objectives that are, that are a part of, of the, that particular board and committee. And, and I think, like I said, there's a long history and a relative and, and a great track record of town staff providing high quality service to boards and committees. Um, I do think the dynamic and the demands have changed a little bit. I already talked about that, but I think that, um, it's 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 the interaction, it's the communication between staff and and boards and committees. On this particular one, I will take responsibility for um, maybe not communicating as well. But there were other conversations happening about the role of the of the or I shouldn't say the role, the charge and information that didn't exist that was being asked for, and kind of trying to clarify that. And that's why requests come to the town manager because that that's where the the kind of um, gatekeeper for resources is. Um, but that's not an intent to not provide the services. It's just an intent, like you said, Henry, to be more efficient. Um, I do agree with Ruth that it is important that town employees know that the uh, personnel bylaw task force uh, exists. Um, and I think, and we, and we will certainly notify employees that, the, that they have a website and the committee exists. And, um, you know, I do think that that's, that'll help serve uh, future engagement. Okay, thank you. Um, good discussion. And um, Carrie and I will talk some more and we will have this on our agenda for January 3rd. Thank you, Henry, for bringing up this very important question. Thank you, Ruth and Anne. And the thank you. Okay, we are on to the committee nominations. Hmm. So, sorry, I don't have... Thank you. So, uh, committee nominations, Frank G. Feely of 347 Lexington Road to the Concord Municipal Affordable Housing Trust for a two-year term to set to expire April 30th, 2023. Okay, committee appointments. So, move to appoint Ray Brutomeso of 1001 Main Street to the 2229 Main Street Advisory Committee for a term set to expire on April 30th, 2024. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. I uh, will note that we have some miscellaneous correspondence. Um, and I'd like to actually uh, make a statement regarding one of those pieces of correspondence. Oh, okay. From... So let me just note what it is. Um, we have an online petition 
No, no, it's actually the uh, letter from the deputy town manager uh, to me. Okay, well, okay, give me a minute to just say what we have in this lane use correspondence, sure. then you can make your statement. So um, we have some of us received um, a copy of an online petition requesting a moratorium on White Pond uh, renovations and construction. Uh, we also have in miscellaneous correspondence a letter from Henry to the state um, organization um, that controls the armory. I've forgotten the exact name of it. Thank you for Henry for sending that. And we have an email from Kate Hodges um, that is I think what you want to address, Matt. That's right. So I just wanted to uh, state that I, I regret if anyone miss uh, took the statement that I made at the most recent um, meeting where we were discussing the uh, interim town manager appointment when uh, Kate Hodges uh, had previously made her statement about um, taking on the acting and in, in interim roles. And that uh, in stating that, well, one candidate doesn't want it, I was not intending to imply that Kate was uh, unwilling, unable. In fact, she has done this job in the past, and as she cited, was uh, very, uh, you know, prepared to take that role on. Um, it was really strictly around the permanent town manager role that she had made that statement. So I do agree that it would have been possible for someone to miss misconstrue what I said and and I apologize for that and just wanted to correct the record. Okay, thank you for your clarification. And at this time we will take public comment. Okay, come on up to the microphone. And please state your name and address for the record. And and I'm here because um, I am a. Do I need to say it again? Sure, why not? Laura Levan, 58 Nimrod Drive. Um, I'm here because I'm a, a regular attendee at the BD uh, Center and especially at the pool. And I attended the Board of Health meeting last week. Uh, in which they discussed some of the um, um, some of the safety factors uh, again, and they worded a letter to you um, about uh, recommending that all all users of the pool be vaccinated uh, because in the pool you cannot wear a mask. Um, and so some of, some of us that are vaccinated and know there are unvaccinated people that use the pool are worried about that. We wanted the town to, um, to make, make a regulation that uh, people be vaccinated to use the pool. Now, if they're too young, you know, that's a different story. But for those that are eligible, I would hope that Concord would uh, require that uh, for use at the BD pool. Okay. Uh, have you taken that up with the Board of Health? Yeah. And they wrote you a letter. Mm -hmm. They did. They, I went to their meeting on December 14th and they worded a letter recommending that the town require proof of COVID vaccination in order to use the pool. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And can I just say one thing? Um, it's impossible for me to find any of your emails. I don't know how you got that email petition, but when I click on the links on the website, it goes to nowhere. And I finally called the town office and I just got, you know, leave your name and number and we'll call you back. And they never did. So. For whatever reason that is done deliberately, it is. Yeah, so there are I no. Can't reach my there, own well, no, board. but there are no email addresses on the town website. There are for, the select board e emails. Oh, but no, just for not. The, not for the individuals, just yes. for the board. 
Yeah, there is a yes. address. It's Select H Dane at ConcordMA.gov. S Bates at ConcordMA.gov. No, it's not there. I think you have to go to a special to to place. Select board page. I did go to the select board Here, page. Let me just take a peek. Uh, this is the select uh, board, mm. and then it says email, and I click on that, and it goes nowhere. Right, but there's uh, yeah, <laughs> but there's a different page <laughs> that has. So you know what? We'll talk to um. This. Yeah, we'll talk to Chris. And who? Uh, you talk know to what it is? Is um, their hyperlinks. Okay, we'll 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 talk to sort that about out. that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, and just for what it's worth, that's an anti-phishing um, thing, right? right. So that oh. bots can't. Well, uh, right. Yeah, I know, oh. it's a difficult I mean, thing. I to... <laughs> didn't get into this meeting tonight, and I promise that I'm just going to drive to that. So there, we could still talk to Chris. There could be directions that said when you have emailed, you know, to send it to him, and then he'll send it to. Okay. Him. We'll figure that out. Thank you for your comment. We'll we'll work on oh. that. Try to figure it out. So, I mean, more important is the pool, right? Oh. Right. Okay. Thank you, Terry. I don't know if you can see, but uh, Ned Perry had his hand up, and then Mary Hartman also has hers up. Oh, thank you, uh, Ned Perry. Good evening, Mr. Chair and the Select Board. Ned Perry, three six two Bedford Street. A uh, couple of comments and then a uh, more in-depth comment. If the personnel board had been doing its work for the last six to eight years with uh, members present, uh, many of the issues that you were, have been asking about tonight on the budget uh, would have been foreseen. And if the town manager had responded to the goals and objectives that you set for them six months ago, you similarly would have some of the answers uh, and to the questions that you were asking. What I was uh, really signing on to comment on was last Monday, um, the personnel task force met at four o'clock and were essentially stonewalled by the two select board members present being Susan Bates and the chair. Four hours later at the Transportation Advisory Committee, the Transportation Advisory Committee was given the absolute green light to ask Aaron Stevens, the liaison to the Transportation Advisory Committee, to go to other department heads and ask for input on transportation issues. It was shocking that within four hours, we would see the absolute diametrically opposed positions uh, dealing with our task force and our committees and our boards. I look forward to the January 3rd meeting uh, where you'll be providing guidance. And I hope that we will find that the new administration uh, led by Kerry is more cooperative with the citizens through our transparency and our government, which is really based upon citizen involvement and all of you. And I appreciate the approval that you have given to the task force uh, charge for the personnel task force tonight. And I hope that you will support it going forward because it's such a crucial part of our government. We used to be at the top of the municipal employment world and we have fallen off that. And all of you and the personnel board and the personnel task force, I hope will help us get back on top. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Perry. And the other person I think was Mary Hartman. That's right, thanks, Terry. Um, Mary Hartman, 16 Concord Green. I'm a member of the Finance Committee. I'm speaking for myself, even though things I'm gonna say are things I know because I'm on the Finance Committee. Um, the first thing is I was glad to see you had such a thorough conversation about the, the FY23 budget. I wanna make a comment about um, the raising the 5% cap on the tier two capital spending. Um, the conversation that, that I heard was that a lot of that is due to the fact that some infrastructure improvements have been put on hold and that is true. But I also wanna remind um, the select board that a lot of tier two spending in the last few years has been for recreation projects that are probably one time 
projects, things like White Pond, things like Jiro, things like Warner Dredging. So the fact that um, infrastructure improvements have been put on hold it, in some part is due to the fact that recreation has taken quite a large piece of the 5% uh, that we've been allocating to tier two. For example, in FY22, um, more between Warner Pond dredging and White Pond, we spent 1.7, appropriated 1.7 out of 4 million. So again, that's a temporary thing. And just keep that in mind when this comes around again to look at um, changing that cap. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other people on Zoom that have public comment? Uh, nobody has their hand up. Okay. Um, I uh, Terry, can I, I guess I'm not on the blog, but I just, I didn't do it in my town manager's report, but I did want to thank the board again for the opportunity and to really thank uh, my colleagues here in town government um, for their really amazing commitment and energy and inspiration to me uh, during some really challenging times. And um, I wish all of you uh, best of luck. Fairly well. Thank, thank you. Thank you, you Stephen. You Good too. Luck. Happy holidays to everyone. We will see you next year. Uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And if you want to see the email address,